welcome back to Plug and Pay, a talk show where we bring you the latest and greatest of global payroll. I'm Angelique, Paysar's Head of Content, and today I'm here with Max, our Head of Service Delivery. Hi, Max. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Angelique. It's good to be back for another episode of Plug and Pay. And I think we have not just the two of us, but we have a very exciting guest. Yes, we do indeed. This is my first time chatting with one of our guests, so I'm very excited to introduce Edo Rina, the EMEA Regional Payroll Manager at Verifone. So Edo, welcome to Plug and Pay. Thanks for joining us. Um, to get things started, if you'd like to just introduce uh, yourself and uh, you know your career in payroll and tell our listeners a little bit about that. Sure, and uh, thank you, Angelique. Thank you, Max, for having me here. I'm very excited. And uh, yes, so uh, about myself, I start a career in uh, in payroll, let's say, uh, around 11 years ago. But uh, before going uh, jumping into that, I'll say that my experience, let's say, is not only around payroll, but it's also around customer service. Uh, uh, I've been working quite seven, uh, quite a quite few years in customer service, around seven years. And I'm mentioning this because I think it's very important for payroll professional, um, you know, to have the attention and the vision and the uh, focus towards the customer, towards mm -hmm. our employee, right? So for me, having worked for seven years in a customer service really helped me a lot to have this sort of um, customer-oriented mindset, you want to say. And uh, I think it's very, very helpful and it's going to uh, help me. I think it's helped me a, a lot during my my career. But um, as I mentioned, you know, the time moved forward and uh, I finished eventually my studies and I moved to Poland. Uh, I was doing some volunteering services here and then I said, OK, I would like to stay in Poland. And then I start to apply here and there for some role. I was trying to leverage my language skills back then. And uh, I was, let's say, surprisingly, I was... Uh, uh, lucky enough to uh, land a job in uh, uh, at IKEA uh, as HR specialist with Italian, and soon after I moved to uh, to the payroll position, so Ital payroll specialist with Italian, and that actually marked my uh, my my career, right? So, and I must say, I must admit that you know probably like every payroll professional would say that the payroll career was never the chosen one. <laughs> no. And actually, that, that's proof to say, I mean, I was, I, I didn't choose that, I must admit that it was by chance. So, and then yeah. actually, uh, it was very, very tough at the beginning. I felt a bit of, uh, you know, frustration. I was scared because I was uh, navigating to the new system. You know, that was SAP on the time. And, uh, you know, uh, managing other stakeholders, talking with the payroll providers, so a lot of information. And there was, uh, that was for me a very uh, huge, learning curve, right? But thanks to the team I was working with, they, somehow they helped me to overcome this kind of first barrier. And that was the moment that actually I realized to be kind of fulfilled because it was not only about numbers, it was not only about SLAs, but it's also also it was also about talking with other stakeholders, talking with the employee, engaging other other team members. So I really enjoyed. But so I start with Italian payroll and eventually I transitioned to the international one with Coca-Cola. Uh, Coca-Cola, it was a great experience. So uh, I was working for uh, operational uh, for some uh, African countries and European countries. But then, uh, you know, they gave me the right tools and the trust that allows me to evolve from individual contributor to the people contributor. And I think that was a really a game changer. Mm. Uh, you know, it's completely, you need completely different skill set there, you know, because you need people, you work with people. So it's completely different. So for me, it was a unique challenge. And uh, somehow, uh, thanks to the challenge, I, you know, it shaped my journey, shaped my career to the moment I arrived to, to become an EMEA, uh, the EMEA Regional Parent Manager uh, at uh, Verifone. And uh, during this 11 years of journey, I really, I generally saying that I didn't accomplish, I wouldn't have accomplished anything if I would have met beautiful team members and also oh. great leaders that inspire me along the way, right? So I, I'm i very grateful f f to them. And uh, yes, so this is like uh, the, the the 11 years, actually 18 years journey uh, to, to I am, where I am today. Uh, but beyond of the realm of payroll, I am also uh, a proud father of uh, one year and a half Leonardo. So I'd say he's uh, like, another full-time or part-time job yes. to add on top of it. And uh, 
Yes, and uh, yes, I um, I love sports and I'm trying to make sports part of my daily routine because I found that it's very important for my mental health and it gives me the right energy, you know, to allow me to do the daily task, you know, in payroll and family. So I guess this is, you know, this is a glimpse of who I am. And uh, yes, so thank you. Angelique. Thank you for sharing with us. That's very interesting to, to learn more about you both professionally and personally. Um, so since this episode is going to be the first one of our new uh, season, actually season four and a new year, 2024, um, we wanted to uh, base it around that theme. So the theme of today's conversation is going to be New Year's resolutions payroll style. Um, so we wanted to ask you, uh, Edo, if you could choose some New Year's resolutions, some things that you want to perhaps change this year going into going into your role or, or what you would like to see, what you think could make life easier, what would you say would be uh, your New Year's resolution for 2024? I, I think it's an interesting question. And uh, mm -hmm. I think working in payo, uh, there would be quite a few things I would like to look at with, you know, uh, with the lens and try to change. So definitely something around, you know, the cooperation, first of all, with the other uh, departments. And so having some sort of, you know, um, cross-functional, focused on the cross-functional collaboration. And uh, I think, and this is based on my experience, payroll sometimes works in a silo, right? So we work and that's only us know what we are doing, right? So, and uh, I think it's going, my resolution would be to leverage and kind of fostering the collaboration with the other departments. So, and this is, I think, is going to be a very easy win because you, I would be simply, uh, you know, creating some opportunity to have some training with the other departments. And because I'm saying this, because as I said, we work in a silo, so sometimes the other department don't really know what are our uh, needs, don't really know what are our expectations, right? In terms of data uh, format, in terms of timelines, and this creates, and I guess this connects much to one of your poll about the data quality, because Correct. this creates errors, right? This creates confusion, delay. At the end, the employee is going to be the one who suffer, right? So, and this is having this uh, collaboration, I think, is going to um, share what are the, the basic things. And this is not only valid for payroll that needs to share with the other, but also payroll needs to understand what are the other departments. For example, when we do the payroll calendar, right, and we we start from the pay date, we go down up to the cutoff. And of course, you know, when we do the, the cutoff, we need to also take into consideration, make an example, like the commissions. We can't have, for example, the commission before certain date because there are interdependencies with the other departments. Sales team is not ready. Finance is not ready. So we need to know. We need to be aware of this. Mm -hmm. We create a new wage type. Why we need to connect with accounting? Because we need a new GL file. Why? What is GL file? Why we need? So I'm talking about this correlation. I'm talking about these yeah. things that we really need to take into consideration. So, and again, this is, I think, an easy one. And uh, again, uh, it requires a common effort. And we need to have this kind of mindset that is not only payroll, is not only HR and finance, but we need to work together as one team. That's what I'm. 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 For, I'm kind of huge fan of moving to towards that kind of mindset. That's, That's great. It. Thanks for sharing, Eduardo. I think, um, you know, we have the, we typically break the payroll process down in pre-payroll, run payroll, post-payroll, and within the pre-payroll process, our biggest partner in crime is HR, right? Yeah. And if you look at the post-payroll process, it, it's finance. I, as you mentioned in the, in the introduction to the, uh, in the answer of the question is, we're stuck in the middle. Uh, yeah. And we need to kind of break out of the middle to make sure the people in the pre-payroll process know what we need. But on the other hand, also that we can support them, right? Because payroll kind of delivers on HR's promise. But we can't stop after that because somehow we need to get the payroll and labor cost into the GLs, right? So exactly. if, if you would think of um, ways to kind of break those barriers, uh, and you've said you're going to do this in 2024, right? It's not an ambition. You're going to do this in 2024. So That's right. <laughs> exactly. What would be kind of your advice to people who also feel like they're kind of stuck in the middle? How would they need to go about to talk to HR or talk to uh, finance to truly become partners in the organization? I think, uh, Max, the, 
the issue here is the mindset. Like, you know, mm. as I said, I think we work, we, we tend to work in a, in a silos saying, okay, it's not my business. I don't care if it's HR or it's finance. You, I, I, I mind only my own business, which is, I think, the wrong mindset. So yeah. an advice would be try to s- switch the mindset, trying to understand why Perry is asking to deliver the input on time? What are the consequences? Or why HR is asking, I don't know, to, to provide certain data or certain certificate from the payroll provider on time? You know, mm. all these kind of little things. And I guess to answer to your question, I think the advice and what I've been trying to do in my previous, uh, during my my my, um, my career is really talk and, and share having this conversation. And that's why I put this uh, probably as, as a first point, because again, we need to work uh, and act as a team, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I guess this is what I, I, will, I, I would, uh, I would say as I would give as an advice, you know, talking and understanding what are the consequences of not delivering on time or according to our our needs. So that's that's the only uh, practical advice I did because I actually I put into practice like having this kind of, for example, pre-payroll uh, meetings, right? With HR yeah. or post-payroll meetings, right? And I guess this is something that is easily doable, but everything starts with the mindset. So as long as you don't change the mindset, you can have all the meeting you want. <laughs> yeah. There will be no changes, I think. Yeah, exactly. And I think maybe also uh, on the flip side is asking HR to kind of deliver what we need. It might also be uh, nice to give something back to the HR team, which probably is like uh, levels of automation that there's not any additional work on the inputs they need. Or if I think back of my time, I was able in my last job to give them back two days and kind of uh, push back the cutoff by two business days. They were ecstatic about that as well, which maybe brings us into uh, kind of the next topic around efficiency in global payroll, right? I think when we last spoke, you're also constantly looking for efficiency gains in global payroll. So what do you think kind of the levers that you can pull to make sure that that cutoff is kind of pushed back by one or two days to put some of the pressure off of HR and give them more time to deliver quality inputs? I think, and I guess, uh, Max, what, what you discussed, it just, uh, you, you mentioned about the pre-payroll part. And I guess this is where, uh, if you ask me uh, again, probably I'm jumping to the question, but uh, the first question that you said, but I, I think this that will be the next topic, the mm. next focus in the pre-payroll is where actually the massive work happen, where we yeah. need to collect all these kind of inputs, different spreadsheet, translate email into uh, uh, into Flexi for manual work. So, I guess what I would be uh, probably um, in order to achieve and try to push back those two days and you know accommodate those requests, I think we need to work on the uh, on collecting and simplifying the collection of the, of our data because what I see today is still we are a bit of obsolete in a way that still mm. rely a lot on those on those manual manual input manual input creates more uh, errors it's like perfect environment for errors you know duplication yeah. as well one of those and uh, you know it removed time from the payroll team that could be used for other uh, to add even more value to the to the department right so uh, i would focus on you know automation on the on the pre-payroll part without having for example uh, the need of a charge sharing something with us like having in one platform, and we eventually download those, that, that report, we download the, the OT or, or OTP, et cetera. So I, mm-hmm. I guess I would focus in order to help the other team department, I would focus on on the automation, on the on the pre-payroll part. And that's mean because I think what, what I see is like, you know, payroll team is always and often focused on, you know, clicking, download the report, this kind of automatic stuff and tasks yeah. that could be replaced by the computer. Computer are very good at it, you know, and I think we could use this resource in other ways. So, and one of the focus would, for me would be go out there in the market, understanding what are the software, the solution that could eventually support that, support my vision, support you know my my team uh, effort. So to answer to your question, Max, I guess this is uh, that would be one of the one of the solution, you know, leverage the technology. So I guess you know having one key entry for all the data, right? Yeah. And uh, I, we discussed with me, Max, about how many Flexiform we are using. Even one Flexiform for 
flexible um, input, one for fixed input, one from higher, one from termination, which is in long term is not is not possible. It creates a lot of stress for my team. Yeah, for exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the, I, I used to call them the not so flexi forms, but um, but I think um, you know when, when you look at our the circle of influence of uh, of payroll professionals, right? We can't just say to the chief chief human resource officer, hey, you need to get a new global HR system, fix all of this, and they'll jump up. Yeah, sure, we'll do that. Great, we'll do that from uh, starting from next Monday, right? So I guess I'm also trying to look for what is kind of within payroll's remit to, uh, to 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 drive those automations and efficiencies within your scope, right? What can you do yourself to uh, to make sure you solve those problems? I'm sure you yeah. will have many examples. You know, could, could you share one that you've kind of implemented within your lifetime without requesting all kinds of changes from the HR department themselves? Yeah, and. Yeah, definitely, Max. And before probably jumping to the example, and I think I yeah. want to echo to what you said that you know you go to the uh, GFW etc. and you ask for for this, and I guess you you really made a point because uh, I think what has to be changed before mm. uh, achieve this, I think has to be some sort of change on mindset and recognition to the payroll department within the organization, understanding how much payroll is important for the organization. And by and by saying so, I'm referring to the fact that, as you said, we need payroll. We work as a ghost, right? As long as yeah. we employees are paid in a timely manner and accurately, everybody is happy and everything is working, right? So it's kind of you go to the to the yeah. senior. What's manager, the problem? <laughs> yeah, what's the problem? Everything is working, but actually they probably are not aware of the complexity that payroll is facing in all eight input and we make it up a late termination that has to be paid the same day of the termination. So you need yeah. to engage with the cash team, check if we have enough funds, all these kind of things around, right? And you know, and for me, changing the having this kind of recognition towards payroll, meaning investing more budget toward payroll, towards payroll, towards the technology, towards doing some sort of assessment of the processes, like investing in some external party that comes and say, hey, guys, this process do not work, does yep. not work, the system does not work, or here we go, we got some errors, and this creates some losses. So that kind of really health check, as I think he, as he said, Max, right? So yeah. I guess this is this is um, important. But of course, the reality is different. And now I connect with your question. Of course, I was trying to, um, uh, referring to the Flexi form, you know, yeah. understanding why we have, for FlexiForm within the same entity, why we cannot simply combine because there is no automation. So the payroll provider does not put those FlexiForm directly into their system, right? So there is still manual work. So I was trying to reduce those number of FlexiForm, right? And which is a, a very easy task, but you know, at least, you know, it's kind of uh, somehow alleviate the, the pain of my team members. Yeah. But uh, another mm, example would be uh, leverage workday and uh, especially for the time and attendance because you know in uh, in my experience I've seen that you know there are m some countries that have the uh, time and attendance with it for example workday and other do not have and we still yeah. rely on the overtime via flex uh, via excel file via email even right so all these kind of things so I was trying to focus on those on those particular pain point which reduce the number of errors Mm. You know, the numbers of email trails because, you know, we just download the report. And uh, at the same time, you empower the managers because now the managers, before was everything on HR, but now the managers are the ones responsible to click and approve, yeah. right? So I guess this is one of the consequences that we'll have, okay. we'll, you know, I one of the examples I, I have in my mind, but, you know, I wish again that probably... Uh, if for 2024 and beyond, I think that you know this kind of mindset and understanding how vital, vital and important payroll is probably yeah. will, I wish would change. Yeah, exactly. We need to raise the profile, right? But uh, also link it back to the silos and end to end because you could implement a wonderful HR system, but once the data leaves an HR system like Workday or Success Factors, and then it needs to travel to payroll, but it doesn't travel with a Ferrari, but it travels with a walking stick. Right yeah. then, you could implement any global HR system. Once it leaves it, it leaves automation, and it's again room for uh, or, or, you know errors or <laughs> manual processes. Yeah. So, I think it was an organization the payroll's role was 
is to educate people to look end to end. Finance will look at how does it work in finance ERPs. HR will look at not all HR professionals, of course, but most that I've met will look at how does it work in HR. So maybe it's our role as global payroll professionals to kind of build that storyline, how data travels between all those yeah. systems, the different touch points, the delays, the the, the the errors and speaking to the to the flexi forms our block pays out a little bit we're, we're competing with excel right because it's basically excel getting data right. out getting data in so we've solved it if anyone wants it solved we could like take the data and translate it into flexi forms uh but of course it would be better to get rid of it all all together right so we're we're speaking of 2024 ai machine learning uh chat gpt we're still talking about how to move data from one system to another system yeah right through excel making sure it's paid so i think you know there's still a lot to be done in this space but 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 it is truly exciting hey um yeah. I, I wanted to link it back to your introduction where you've kind of praised some of the leaders you've worked with you know and you're you know you're a people manager yourself uh, if we think of leadership what would be kind of the 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 thing that comes to mind the advice you once got from one of your leaders that still resonates with you yeah i I, I think for, for leadership, it's something, everything starts with passion, I'd say. And that's actually why I'm very passionate about people and leading them. And uh, I'm passionate about, yeah. you know, uh, ensure that they develop and they succeed. So that, that's, I start with that passion in, in my, in back of my head. Uh, and uh, for me, uh, you know, working in an environment where the team is spread across the globe, right? So I don't have, a, I mean, a few team members like here in Poland, but the rest is mm. around Europe. Yeah. Uh, I, I think what I learned and also this based on my experience and but also, you know, uh, looking around and taking some, uh, you know, uh, uh, some uh, leader as, as a role. I think uh, what I uh, learned is that I need to put, and this is my statement, my team needs before my own needs, right? And I guess this is the the mm. part that I think helped me to uh, to lead across, you know, this kind of uh, uh, global workforce. And exactly. uh, um, one one of the piece uh, that uh, I, I would put into 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 this conversation is because you manage in different location. I think one of the aspects is to be clear when it comes about the communication and. Uh, clearly communicate where we are heading to and uh, setting up the tone and the expectation, right? And yeah. uh, I guess this is uh, this is uh, mm, crucial, but also you need to learn to be flexible, right? And because, you know, all each of us are a different hidden story, it, it, different things that are happening in our private lives. So it's very, it's very hard to, to us to have one single way of, uh, yeah. of a leadership style, right? So, and this is, you know, again, um, goes to the uh, sort of my statement that you know I want to be the best manager not for everybody but just for you for you and for you just adapting exactly. and understanding what are the, your real needs what are your real expectations and of course you need to be open and you need to be uh, yeah you need to be kind of probably emotionally mature to also get some feedback right mm -hmm. because if somebody tells you that, you know, probably gives you some constructive feedback, you know, sometimes you go in the de defensive mode and make it personal. Yeah, out. exactly. Right. So, and I guess this requires time, right. And you learn, you learn, you learn. Uh, so this is something that I, I apply in my leadership. And uh, one thing additional is that I walk the talk for me is important when you lead the team. Because yes. I remember, and that was a mistake, you know, I'm, I'm continuing learning about leadership, about payroll. So I'm co a constant student, right? Um, and I remember uh, at the beginning when I joined, when I moved, transitioned to the people manager, I was super excited, I know. And I was I, I was always saying, yes, 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 yes. I was I somehow yes. I was over promising. But then, you know, you're also payroll manager. So you deal with time with deadline you need to approve you need to respond some queries so you have two things that you need to juggle with yes. and and this is what i learned i say okay i don't stop over promising because then you're gonna lose trust you're gonna you know probably uh, it's not nice when you say something and then you don't you don't yeah. you don't deliver it right so it's not over promise under deliver you'd rather under promise exactly. and over deliver right yeah and this is something that you know you learn and uh, i openly say that you know it's something that you, you learn and uh, uh, so this is other things I, I would put in place and uh, 
referring to one of my mentors uh, and said what Ilona mentioned, like, Edo, remember, and this connecting to the feedback, remember that the feedback is a present, right? Mm -hmm. So you might accept, right? Or you might you know, just put apart, right? And since then, I, you know, back then, I, I keep this, this uh, in my mind because it's very important in, in a leadership role. That's, that's, I think, um, yeah. And of course, you need to be always yourself, always yourself, uh, because people, you know, with, with time, we'll understand, okay, this is not real you, right? So I think yeah. you need to be trust uh, to yourself and towards your uh, employee, especially, right? So this is, uh, something that I would consider uh, while doing the um, having this kind of role as a leader. Exactly. Thanks for sharing. So this speaks about uh, authenticity, right? Uh, you could pretend yeah. to be someone else, but over time you'll always be yourself. So right. why does not start with being you? And you've mentioned you, you also kind of manage teams across different parts of the world, right? So there's also this time zone and cultural aspect. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> there was one piece of advice that I remember that I once got in a I think in a live session in Washington at the APA Congress now, Peya was um, never assume. Never assume that people understand what you mean. Never assume that when they're quiet, that they don't have anything to say. Because if you would look at like Asian cultures, they, they have a different perspective of hierarchy. Or even the country, as I, I've experienced, that like you're now living in, in Poland, there's also different views as hierarchy. As yeah. far as the Netherlands, we don't care about hierarchy. We will just always <laughs> speak our mind to whoever we will speak to, right? So there's also those yeah. type of dimensions you need to first, as someone interacting with someone else, be aware of, but also managing a team. Um, so uh, have you experienced the same, uh, Eduardo, you know, when, when you spoke to people across the world as different type of cultural dimensions? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, the, having the cultural awareness. I think this is mm. something that, you know, I experienced and again, during my career, I learned a lot because I was assuming, I know, and I was, okay, let's yeah. try, you know, to use the same, uh, use the same wording, but then, you know, you end up having, for example, one person that is a bit, a bit more sensitive. So, um, if I speak probably with an Italian, we get along straight away. If I speak yeah. with the Spanish, the same, but if I speak with somebody from Iceland, probably it's going to be completely different, right? Okay. Uh, the same. And so this is something I experienced. And uh, again, uh, I've been uh, doing some courses, of course, but also I think the majority was learning and adjusting and going back to what I said. You need to be the best manager for that team members because, you know, you have the one-on-one -on -one and then you kind of taste the ground. Okay, didn't yeah. work. That did work. So I did I did experience that, but uh, you know, I'm now more aware of how important it is to have this cultural awareness. Yeah. And uh, yes, and this is something that uh, it happened. And it's not pleasant sometimes because you're trying to convey the message in a yeah. wheel, but then the reaction is completely different. It's like, what did I do? Yeah. Right? And it's like, <laughs> I didn't mean to be. Wasn't rude. my intent. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Right. So, and that's, that's the thing that uh, you learn. And that's why mm, I think being a leader requires a lot of personal uh, sacrifice and require it's, it's not an easy, an easy job. And that's why I said at the beginning that for me it was a game changer because you need mm -hmm. really to have and develop kind of new skill set and, uh, one thing I've noticed, and probably uh, you, you can also relate on that, that, you know, sometimes, you know, people are promoted for their te those technical skills, right? They're promoted to the, to the people leader role. Yeah. But what is missing is this kind of training to the leadership skill, mm. you know, working with empathy, you know, and be uh, cor courageous and, you know, be clear, decisive. So I think it's also important whenever there will be you know, such such opportunity all, always take into consideration that, you know, you're leading with managing and uh, leading with people. So you need to have also some tool to perform at your best and do not harm your team members. So I guess this is something that we need to take into consideration. Yeah. Definitely. Yes. And I think it's it's great that you're sharing, you know, a, a lot of advice on on um, how you can always keep learning. Like it's always, no matter how many years uh, you've been working in the industry, you're always gonna be learning more. So I guess to, to wrap up this episode, I'd like to ask you if you could just give one piece of advice for 
for global payroll professionals or leaders a parting piece of advice um to you know be the change that that they would like to see in their in their role what would oh, you only do? one right <laughs> i mean <laughs> <laughs> i think yeah uh, i i think something that one, one thing is a uh, you mentioned about uh continuous uh, you know stay uh, open for learning in terms of um uh, always trying to uh, look for new opportunities out there in terms of uh, updates in the best practices when it comes about the industry, when it comes about tax regulation. Um, because always, wh whenever there will be some discussion, you can make some uh, informative decision based on your knowledge. So this is going to be helping your department, it's going to be helping the organization overall. That, that would be one, always be open, informed, but also um and i guess this is why i'm here uh, stay open with the with your networking because you know there are so many great people out there much way much cleverer than me and i'm very happy to know all of them because you know you exchange the knowledge you exchange the experience and you know you're gonna get richer you, you really you can also implement those ideas right so i guess this is something that uh, if you want to change something you need to be open and uh, stay curious right um I, I think this and probably the last advice i know i'm not sure if i'm loud but we discussed about, about, on, about, technology, <laughs> about technology i think we discussed about technology and we said probably in peril the technology is not going as fast as the outside world right you know uh we talk about chat box in uh uh, chat gpt and still we are talking about translating email into excel and flexible yes. right so i think something that i really would like uh if you want to see the change you need to embrace the technology i think this is important uh because the technology and again probably i'm the part that say technology will not take away in our job in payroll on the contrary will make our life easier and for payroll profession will allow to focus on other uh, more strategic and added, added value roles uh, like and that's 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 my point of view so don't be afraid of that kind of red button that you click because i never seen by the way but you know don't, don't be just in movies that. right when the bad guy tries <laughs> to launch a missile like, yeah exactly so embrace technology i guess is going to be very uh helpful and it's going to make our life uh easier i'd say um yeah that's that's those are my advice sorry angelique i want to say just one but i you know i couldn't stop uh, yeah. I love the passion. <laughs> no, we love, love the passion for payroll. Um, no, so basically, 2024 is the year to be open, stay curious, and embrace technology. So yeah. thank you. Thank you very much for, for joining us and for sharing your perspectives, your advice with us. It's been a really great chat, and I'm sure our listeners have loved it as much as we have too. Um, so yes, I think this is a good place for us to wrap up with this episode of Plug and Pay. Um, thank you as always for joining us and for listening. We will be back in around two weeks time and you can stream all our episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts. And if you did enjoy this episode, feel free to leave us a review so we can spread the word about plug and pay. And we also will be running some webinars, which you can find out about over on our LinkedIn Paysar page. Um, so, yes, did you have anything else to add, Max? Well, I want to thank uh, Edo for sharing his advice. I think it's really practical in tune uh, with the day in the life of a payroll professional. Speaking of the day in the life of a payroll professional, we're actually hosting an event in Amsterdam on the 8th of February. So if you are in the Netherlands or you're able to travel, do join us because you'll be enriched, as Edo said, with a network of global payroll uh, professionals. And in contrast with other events, you don't need to first explain what payroll does because it will be like-minded people. So you'll be able to tap into that. So Angelique, thanks for, for running it again. And Edo, really appreciate you joining uh, the podcast and we'll see much more of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.